بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين السلام عليكم brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته I'd like to welcome you back to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad If you recall in our last episode we spoke about the Prophet's infancy we spoke about the events surrounding his birth and we spoke about the first few years that he spent uh, under the care of Halima Saadiya, who was his foster mother for approximately four to five years. Now, typically, a, a child that is sent out to live with the Bedouins would spend a, about two years, but you see that there was a lot of trust between Amina and Halima, and she felt that it, would, it was safer and better for him to continue living uh, with, uh, with Halima. Now, Ibn Ishaq, uh, who uh, he reports, and we spoke about uh, the importance of the seerah of Ibn Ishaq in our first episode. So if you need a refresher on that, or if you haven't listened to episode one, I encourage you uh, to do so, just to get an idea of the primary sources from which we're uh, reconstructing the life of the Prophet. So Ibn Ishaq reports that when the Prophet ﷺ was six, his mother took him to Medina to visit his father's mother's family, the uh, Banu Najjar. So the Prophet returns to Mecca, he returns to the city after spending about four to five years with Halima and his mother decides that it's time for the young Muhammad to to visit uh, the family the uh, the family of his father and to also pay a visit to his grave so Amina she travels to Medina she meets with Abdullah's uh, maternal uncles she meets other uh, members, she get, gets together with other members of Banu Najjar and you can imagine uh, how sad uh, that trip was she goes and she pays her respects to the grave of her husband uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, who's six years old at this time he goes to the grave of his father and you can imagine what a heart-wrenching moment that is for both Amina and uh, and the young Muhammad. Now, unfortunately, on their return, on their way back from Medina, Amina, the mother of the Prophet, falls ill. And she doesn't recover from this illness, and she actually passes away in a region called Al-Abwa, which is situated between Mecca and Medina. So now the Prophet ﷺ, at the tender age of six, he is living in this world without a mother or a father. Now, her slave, Amina had a slave, and in fact this was a slave of Abdullah, uh, Um Ayman, which is a name that should be familiar to many of us because she plays a pivotal role in the life of the Prophet, uh, you know, uh, throughout his life and even uh, after the death of the Prophet. Um Ayman, is the, she was a slave that belonged to Abdullah and she becomes, she, she plays the role of mother to the Prophet after the death of his own mother. And Um Ayman should also be a familiar name because the Prophet Sallallahu praised her on numerous occasions and she was called one of the women of paradise she was called one of Nisa'ul Jannah by the Prophet. And Um Ayman actually uh, is one of the bravest women in the Islamic tradition because she was among the few who came forward during the Khilafah of Abu Bakr. And she testified to Abu Bakr that Fadak was given to Fatima by the Prophet during his lifetime. So Um Ayman actually testifies that Fadak was 
wrongfully confiscated and usurped from Lady Fatima السلام. So this is a woman who is deeply loyal to the Prophet and uh, his Ahlul Bayt. So after the death of Amina, Um Ayman, she brings the young Muhammad back to Mecca and she continues to play a motherly role in his life. So with the death of Amina and the death of Abdullah, of course, who, who died when uh, before the Prophet was even born, naturally the person who takes custody of him is uh, the Prophet's honorable grandfather, uh, Abdul Muttalib. So the Prophet ﷺ is without a mother, without a father, and he's now under the care of, of Abdul Muttalib. Now, Amina, for those of you who have been to Hajj, Amina is buried in Al Abwa. There was a time when you know people could visit her grave freely, they could recite ziyara. Now, just to shed a little bit of light on the status of Amina, Amina bin Tuhab in the Islamic tradition. Now, in the Sunni tradition, in Sunni orthodoxy, the dominant view is that she died as a kafirah, that she died as a disbeliever. And you find, for example, in Sahih Muslim, there is a narration that is attributed to the Prophet and it is narrated by Abu Hurairah. Now, of course, Abu Hurairah in the Sunni tradition is seen as a reliable companion of the Prophet. And no companion narrates more ahadith than Abu Hurairah. So Abu Hurairah is seen as a reliable, as a trustworthy transmitter of hadith. Now in the Shi'i tradition, he is not reliable. In fact, he is considered to be a serial liar in the Shi'i tradition. Now in Sahih Muslim, we have the following narration, just to kind of give you an idea of the contrast between how, she, how Amina is portrayed in Sunni Islam and how she is uh, portrayed in Shi'i Islam. So we have this narration in Sahih Muslim where it reads, An Abi Huraira, Abu Huraira narrates this from the Prophet, allegedly. Qala zara sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. I'm saying sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, but in the text it only says sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi visited the grave of his mother. Okay, this is after he begins his prophetic mission, he has, of course, this natural attachment to his mother. So he goes and he visits her grave. So Abu Huraira says, Zara Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi qabra ummih. He visits the grave of his mother. Fabaka wa abka man hawla. The Prophet weeps so bitterly and with so much emotion that he causes the people around him to weep. فقال استأذنت ربي في أن أستغفر لها فلم يأذن لي The Prophet then says, as he's weeping profusely over his mother, he says to his companions who accompanied him on this trip to Abwa. He says, I asked my Lord for permission to seek forgiveness for her, but he did not give me permission. Allah did not give me permission to do istighfar for Amina. Why? Because in the Sunni tradition, she, the dominant view at least, she's kafirah. She dies as a disbeliever. Astajiru billah. Then I asked, so Rasulullah says, I cannot ask Allah to forgive her. وَاسْتَأْذَنْتُ رَبِّي فِي أَنْ أَزُورَ قَبْرَهَا فَأَذِنَ لِي فَزُورُ الْقُبُورَ فَإِنَّهَا تُذَكِّرُكُمُ الْمَوْتِ Then I asked my Lord for permission to visit her grave and he gave me permission. Allah said, you cannot ask me to forgive her. I don't forgive her. She's in hellfire. But I give you permission to go visit her grave. And then the Prophet says, so visit the graves, for they will remind you of death. 
So in, unfortunately, I say this, you know, with a heavy heart, unfortunately, the dominant opinion in the Sunni tradition is that Amina bint Wahab, the mother of Rasulullah, is hell-bound. She is from Ahlul Nar. Allah does not even allow the Prophet to ask him to forgive her. The maximum concession that Allah grants to the Prophet is that you're allowed to just go visit the grave. Now what's interesting, you know, this is a woman who carried the Prophet in her womb, who nursed the Prophet, who quenched his thirst, who cared for him. So keep that in mind. And look at the following narration, which is also mentioned in Sahih Muslim. And it's narrated by Abu Hurairah from the Prophet. And this is a hadith that we also have in our uh, uh, books of uh, hadith. قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ بَيْنَمَا كَلْبٌ يُطِيفُ بِرَكِيَّةٍ قد كاد يقتله العطش إذ رأته بغي من بغايا بني إسرائيل فنزعت موقها فاستقت له به فسقته إياه فغفر لها به فغفر لها به. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله says there was a dog moving around a well whom thirst would have killed. So. Picture this, a dog is panting, is thirsty, and is circling, circling around a well. There's no bucket, there's no way to access the water. Suddenly, a prostitute from the prostitutes of Bani Israel. So this is a woman, a sinful woman, a woman who sells her body, a woman who commits zina, who commits fahisha. She saw this dog, and she felt sorry for the dog. And she drew water, there was no bucket to uh, extract water, so she used her shoe to scoop water from the well and quenched the thirst of the dog. And Allah was so pleased with this that He forgave her for her past sins and He gave her the tawfiq of hidayah. And she was pardoned because of this. Now, the question here that we ask, is that Allah Azza wa Jal forgave a prostitute for quenching the thirst of a dog. Allah was so pleased with that action that He gave her the tawfiq of hidayah. He showered her with mercy. But Allah cannot forgive Amina. Let's assume that she, she was a sinful person. Now in the Shia tradition, we believe she was a monotheist. She was following, she was on the deen of of Ibrahim, but let us assume the worst and say that she was a sinful woman. Allah can forgive a prostitute from the prostitutes of Bani Israel, but He can't forgive a woman who quenched the thirst of the Messenger of God, who fed the Prophet, who clothed the Prophet, who nursed the Prophet. So in the Shia tradition, we categorically reject any reports that diminish the integrity and the honor of the mother of the Prophet And of course, from a Shi'i perspective, we see these narrations that paint Amina and Abdullah in a negative light. We believe that these are the influences of Umayyad propaganda because there was a concerted effort by the Munafiqeen who joined Islam outwardly to disparage the Prophet by disparaging his ancestors and painting them as, you know, as polytheists who are hell-bound. You know, since many of them, many of these Khulafa, their great-great-parents are Kuffar, so they did the same thing to the Prophet. They said, oh, you know, the Prophet is no better than us because his parents and his ancestors are also kuffar so this was an attempt to equalize to bring the prophet down to their level and to strip him of uh, the honor of hailing from a noble lineage now as i mentioned 
in the Shi'i tradition, and I thought this would be a suitable time to mention this since we've reached the point in the seerah where the Prophet has lost his mother and the Prophet in his life, on a number of occasions, he goes and visits the grave of Amina. Now in the Shi'i tradition, you find that all of the Shi'i fuqaha, the maraji', the mujtahideen, when they write their legal manuals pertaining to Hajj, when they go, when they present their understanding of the ahkam of Hajj, they designate the ziyara of Amin ibn Tuhab as one of the mustahabbat acts to perform when you are in Mecca because it is situated between, her grave is situated between Mecca and Medina. And there is a ziyara, there is a visitation to recite when you go to the grave of Amin ibn Tuhab. So again, I want you to compare and contrast the Shi'i portrayal of Amina and the Sunni portrayal of Amina. Now, in the ziyarah of Amina bint Wahab, we say, As-salamu alayki ayyatuha tahiratu al-mutahara. In the, the narration from Abu Huraira, where the, the Prophet allegedly says that God didn't even allow me to ask him for forgiveness on, for my mother because she's hellbound. In Shi'i, Ziyarah literature, we address Amin ibn Tuwahab by saying, Peace be upon you, O the pure one, the purified one. As-salamu alayki ya man khassahallahu bi'a'la sharaf. Peace be upon you, O the one who was chosen, who was singled out by Allah with the highest honor, the honor of being the womb that carries the greatest creation of God. You think Allah will put the purest of His creation in the womb of a kafira? As-salamu alayki ya man sata'a min jabeenha nuru sayyid al-anbiya. Peace be upon the one from whom light emanated from her forehead because of the light of the master of prophets. And that light that emanated from her forehead, from her face, because she was carrying the messenger in her, that light illuminated the earth and the sky. As-salamu alayki ya man nazalat li ajliha al-mala'ika Peace be upon the one for whom the angels descended. وَضُرِبَتْ لَهَا حُجُبُ الْجَنَّةِ And the veils of paradise were lifted for her. As-salamu alayki ya man نَزَلَتْ لِخِدْمَتِهَا الْحُورُ الْعِينِ Peace be upon the one who حُور الْعِينِ appeared to her and descended upon her and they gave her from the drinks of paradise. وَبَشِّرْنَهَا بِوِلَادَةِ خَيْرِ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ And who gave her the glad tidings of the birth of the greatest of prophets. As-salamu alayki ya umma rasulillah. Peace be upon you, O the mother of the messenger of God. As-salamu alayki ya umma habibillah. Peace be upon you, O the mother of the beloved of God. فَهَنِيئَ لَكِ بِمَا آتَاكِ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِ so congratulations to you, O Amina, for being the recipient of this great divine grace. Wassalamu alayki wa ala Rasulullah. And peace be upon you, and peace be upon the Messenger of God. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And may His mercy and His blessings uh, be upon you. Now this is how we address Amina bin Tuhab, and we hope. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala illuminates the hearts and the minds of Muslims to come to this realization, to honor the beloved mother of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Now, of course, after, as we've mentioned, after the death of Abdullah and Amina, 
the Prophet ﷺ is now under the care of Abdul Muttalib, his beloved grandfather. And Abdul Muttalib is the chief of Quraysh. He's the most prominent figure in the Arab world at the time. Uh, Quraysh, of course, as we've mentioned numerous times, Quraysh is a super tribe and Abdul Muttalib is at the helm. He is the figurehead. Now in Al-Kafi, Shaykh Al-Kulayni, may Allah sanctify his soul, he reports a riwayah, a tradition from Imam al-Sadiq, our sixth Imam, where Imam al-Sadiq speaks to us about the immense love and respect and care that Abdul Muttalib showed the Prophet when he was a young boy. So we're talking about you know, the Prophet at the age of six, seven, eight years old. He's a young boy. Imam al-Sadiq, he says, كان عبد المطلب يفرش له بفناء الكعبة. The Meccans used to lay a rug out for Abdul Muttalib in the shade of the Kaaba. So Abdul Muttalib, this was a kind of a place of honor. They would spread out a rug, and Abdul Muttalib would sit under the shade because the Kaaba would cast a shadow. He would sit under the shade of the Kaaba. And they would do this out of respect for him. لا يفرش لأحد غيره. No one would have a carpet, a, a rug uh, laid out for them except for Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib is the chief of Quraysh. He's the head of Quraysh. And no one was allowed to sit on that rug except for Abdul Muttalib. So this is kind of like the, the Arabian... Uh, idea of a throne this was you know his seat and it was only reserved for abdul muttalib now out of respect for abdul muttalib no one sat on that rug except for him and you know abdul muttalib had sons and relatives and they would prevent anyone from sitting on that rug فجاء رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وهو طفل يدرج حتى جلس على فخذي عبد المطلب is sitting on this rug under the shade of Kaaba رسول الله the young Muhammad who's six, seven, eight years old maybe he comes and he sits on the lap of عبد المطلب he's sitting essentially on the, that rug that is designated only for the chief of Quraysh. فَأَهْوَى بَعْضُهُمْ إِلَيْهِ عَنْ Some of the young men, some of the, those who were sitting with Abdul Muttalib, they tried to move the young Muhammad away. Because to them, only Abdul Muttalib sits here. It's not appropriate for anyone else to join him on this rug. You know, when a king sits on his throne... There's no one who's sitting on the throne with the king. It's only for the king. فَقَالَ لَهُ عَبْدُ الْمُطَلِبُ when, 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 the, when Abdul Muttalib noticed that someone was trying to move the young Muhammad from his lap and off of the rug, Abdul Muttalib said, he rebuked them. فَقَالَ لَهُ عَبْدُ الْمُطَّلِبِ دَعِبْنِي فَإِنَّ الْمُلْكَ قَدْ أَتَانِ he says to them, leave my son. He calls him my son. For by God, he has something great in store for him. I believe he will one day lead you all. So Abdul Muttalib, he has this, you know, uh, you could say a type of ilmul ghaib that he could foreshadow that this young man would lead them. His disposition is that of one who would lead people. So you see that Abdul Muttalib treated him with so much care that he allowed him to sit in a place where no one else was given permission to sit. And anytime anyone tried to uh, you know, uh, push him away, Abdul Muttalib would rebuke them and he would insist that the young Muhammad sits with him and is treated with 
dignity, and honor. Now, unfortunately, again, so you should be seeing a pattern now. The Prophet ﷺ keeps on losing people who are near and dear to him. He loses his father before he even meets him. He loses his mother and now he is about to lose his loving grandfather. Abdul Muttalib is now advanced in his years. He's an elderly man. He's over the age of 100 and he's now on his deathbed. Now we don't really know, we don't have that much information about what happened in the Prophet's life during this period, but we know that Abdul Muttalib cared for him, he showed him immense respect. And there are narrations that mention that there were certain times where there was a severe drought and famine in Mecca, and Abdul Muttalib would always use the Prophet as a wasila to ask God to send down rain. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would send down rain uh, for the sake of the blessed existence of the Prophet So Abdul Muttalib is on his deathbed. He has many sons, but we see that the most trusted of the sons of Abdul Muttalib is Abu Talib. So this is a conversation between Abdul Muttalib and Abu Talib. Abdul Muttalib is laying on his deathbed and he says, Ya Aba Talib, O oh Abu Talib, انظر أن تكون حافظا لهذا الوحيد الذي لم يشم رائحة أبي ولا ذاق شفقة شفقة أمه. Oh, Abu Talib, ensure that this boy remains as near to your person as your own heart. You know, pay attention to Muhammad. Imagine all of the things that Abdul Muttalib could have mention on his deathbed and usually when a person is on their deathbed they only focus on what's important what is a priority Abu Talib has many sons he's the chief of Quraysh but the care of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is a priority he says to Abu Talib that pay attention to this orphan this child who has who had never who never had the chance to smell the fragrance of his father and did not have enough time to taste the affection of his mother because he lost his mother at the age of six, four or five years. He's with Harima Saadiya. He didn't really enjoy enough time with his mother. You know, treat him as though he's a part of your heart, he's a part of your being. Abdul Muttalib says to Abu Talib that I have many sons. I overlooked all of my sons and chose you alone for this task, for this testament. Why? Because you and his father, the father of Rasulullah, Abdullah, you and his father, you come from the same mother. So there is this natural affinity, this closeness that you feel to the young Muhammad. Ya Aba Talib, Abdul Muttalib continues. In, and this is where you see that Abdul Muttalib and Abu Talib, they believe in Rasulullah even be, before he began his prophetic mission. They knew the future of this boy. Ya Aba Talib, in adrakta ayyama fa'alam anni kuntu min absar nas wa a'lam nas bi. O Abu Talib, if you live to see his heyday, if you live to see him grow up, then remember that I was among the most perspicacious and aware people of who he is. Meaning that I had the foresight. I knew what he would be when he gets older. And then Abdul Muttalib says to Abu Talib, فَإِنْ إِسْتَطَعْتَ أَنْ تَتَّبِعَ فَافْعَلْ 
وَانْصُرْهُ بِلِسَانِكَ وَيَدِكَ وَمَالِكَ If you can, O Abu Talib, follow him openly. If you can follow him openly, do so. Aid him with your tongue, your hand, and your wealth. فَإِنَّهُ وَاللَّهُ سَيَسُودُكُمْ وَيَمْلِكُ مَا لَمْ يَمْلِكْ أَحَدٌ مَنْ مِنْ بَنِي آبَائِي Abdul Muttalib says, For he will, by God, lead you and rule over you as none of my ancestors ever ruled. Abdul Muttalib, he says to Abu Talib that when you witness him, when you see him in his heyday, remember that I was among the first who recognized that this was a special child, that this was a chosen child. So remember me, O oh my son, and follow him and aid him and support him. And then Abdul Muttalib continues, Ya Aba Talib, Ma a'lamu ahadin min abaika ma ta'anhu abu ala hali abi, wala ummuhu ala hali ummihi fahfadhu li wahdati. O oh, Abu Talib, and so you see how emotionally attached Abdul Muttalib is to the Prophet, how concerned he is over him. O oh, Abu Talib, I do not know of any of your ancestors who lost a father as he did, or a mother the way he did. Thus be mindful of his loneliness. Abdul Muttalib says that I cannot think of anyone from my ancestors who lost a father and a mother so tragically in the way that this Muhammad has lost his parents. So have mercy on him. Be kind to him. Be mindful of him. So Abdul Muttalib turns to Abu Talib and says, Do you accept this wasiyya? Do you accept this duty that I am conferring upon you? Abdul Muttalib extends his hand, places it in the hand of his father, and he says, I accept, I will discharge this duty honorably. Now upon hearing this, when Abu Talib accepts this duty from his father, Abdul Muttalib gives a sigh of relief. He feels at ease now knowing that after him, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi will be in good hands. And he says, الآن خفف علي الموت عبد المطلب he says now I can die easy I can die in peace ثم ضمه إلى صدره ولم يزل يقبله ويقول أشهد أني لم أقبل أحدا من ولدي أطيب ريحا منك ولا أحسن وجها منك so therefore he kept kissing, not, not the Prophet, Abu Talib. And he says, I testify that I have never kissed any of my children with a fragrance as sweet as yours or a face as pleasant as yours. So you see that Abdul Muttalib essentially, so Abu Talib is the successor of Abdul Muttalib and the primary duty that Abdul Muttalib gives to Abu Talib is that you have to look after Muhammad, you have to care for him, you have to protect him, and if you witness him in his heyday, remember that I was the one who knew that this is a gifted child, this is a unique child, and if you're able to, support him, aid him with your tongue, with your wealth, with all of the resources at your disposal. Abdul Muttalib passes away. So the Prophet now has lost his father, his mother, and his grandfather. He loses his grandfather at the age of eight. He enters into the custody of Abu Talib. He joins the family of Abu Talib. And Abu Talib, being the loving, kind uncle that he was, he raised him as his own son. In fact, he favored him over his own sons. He gave 
the Prophet special attention. If food was limited, he would deprive his own children before he would deprive Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa From a young age, Abu Talib began to expose the young Muhammad to the world of trade, to the world of business, buying and selling. Abu Talib takes the Prophet ﷺ with him to Syria. Why Syria? As we mentioned, the Arabs had the two uh, trading expeditions, the two annual trading expeditions, which was established by Hashim, as we mentioned. So the trip to Syria was the summer trading expedition. Abu, Abu Talib sees that Muhammad, the young Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, is now at an age where he can accompany with accompany me on this trip. So he joins his uncle. And here, a very important incident in the child, in the early life of the Prophet takes place. And this is a narration about the Christian monk who, who meets the 12-year-old Muhammad when he is on this trading expedition with his uncle. And this narration is mentioned in the books of history and the narration is in the words of Abu Talib. Abu Talib reports, the caravan reached Busra. Busra is a region that is in Syria. It's near Sham. So they're with a caravan. So the caravan reached Busra and stopped at a monastery there. There was a Christian monk who was known for never coming out of the monastery. But he comes out. When this caravan comes out, well, when it passes by his monastery, he comes out. So the monk, Muhayra, brings out food for the caravan. Because it seems that he spotted something that intrigued him. And it brought him out of the monastery. So he brings them food and he sits and he eats with them. And Buhayra's interest was piqued when he met Muhammad. He saw, for instance, that when this young boy walks, there is a cloud that follows him, that shields him from the rays of the sun. There are other things that he sees about the young Muhammad that captivates him, that intrigues him. So Abu Talib, he's, he narrates, he said, so Buhayra says to the young Muhammad, young boy, I shall ask you three questions for the sake of Allat and Al-Uzza. Allat and Al-Uzza are idols that the Arabs worshipped. Now, Muhammad, Abu Talib says, Muhammad grew angry and said, do not ask me for their sake. Don't invoke the names of these idols, for I do not hate anything as I hate them. They are stone idols worshipped by my people. Buhayra said under his breath, that is one characteristic. So it seems that Buhayra, from this narration, we see that he has he's looking for something. There is a prophecy that he's trying to figure out. There are certain qualities and characteristics that he's probing for, that he's searching for in this child. So he says this is one. The fact that he doesn't uh, swear in the name of idols. Then he said, Buhayra says, Then for the sake of God, answer the three questions that I have for you. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi said, Ask what you like, for you have now asked me for the sake of my God and yours, whom nothing matches. After a few more questions, Buhayra falls upon him and he starts to kiss him. He tests him, he asks him some questions. Now we don't know exactly what those questions were, but he asks them, he asks the young Muhammad some questions, he answers those questions and the Christian monk, uh, Buhayra. Now, it's not clear whether he was Christian or not, but he was a monotheist. He begins to kiss and embrace the child, the young boy. 
And he says, you are the answer to Abraham's prayer. You are the answer to the dua of Ibrahim. You are the fulfillment of the prophecy of Isa, of Jesus. You are one purified of the filth of Zaman al Jahili. You are one purified of the filth of the age of ignorance. The monk then turns to Abu Talib. And Abu Talib himself, he says, Then he turned to me and asked, Who is this boy to you? Buhayra says, What is the relationship between you, O Abu Talib, and this boy? For I see that you do not let him leave your side. I see that you're always with him. You don't allow him to stray. You always keep him very close to you. Abu Talib says, he is my son. Buhayra says, the monk, he says, he's not your son. It is impossible that his actual father or mother still be alive. So it seems that there are prophecies in the scriptures about the final messenger. And they know that this is this final messenger is an orphan. His, his father and mother cannot be alive at this stage in his life. So I clarified, Abu Talib says, I explained, I clarified, he is my nephew. His father died when his mother was pregnant. And his mother died when he was six years old. The monk says to Abu Talib, Muhayra says, now you have spoken the truth. I advise that you return him to your city. Be very careful with this child. For if people see him and notice in him what I have noticed, they will do him harm, especially the Jews, because they'll be infuriated that the final messenger of God is a Gentile and not a Jew. So I said, so Abu Talib says, never, God would not let harm befall him. Abu Talib says what? God would not let harm befall him. Now I ask you, does this sound like the words of someone, you know, considering everything that we've mentioned? And inshallah, as we go through the life of the Prophet, you'll see how Abu Talib was the greatest protector and defender of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, especially during the Meccan years. So this is that incident with uh, the, uh, the monk. And inshallah, in our next uh, episode, we'll speak about the Prophet's adult life and, uh, and some, uh, some important events in, uh, in his adult life. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters, for tuning in. And I look forward to uh, having you on another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajjal fajr. Any questions or comments? Welcome. Alaykum as salam wa rahmatullah. So when uh, Abdul Muttalib passed away, who took care of Hazrat Hamza? Who took care of, of Hamza? I mean, his. Uh, you have to remember that uh, Hamza's uh, mother was still alive. Hala was still alive. And uh, so because, because the Prophet was an orphan from his mother's side and his father's side, it was, uh, it was more of a pressing issue to have him, uh, his care uh, arranged and taken care of. But I imagine, I mean, off the top of my head, I would imagine that he was in the care of, he remained in the care of his mother. And of course, when you have a family that is that large, I'm sure that you have uncles who, uh, who step in uh, if, there's, uh, if there's any need. Thank you. And uh, was the st statement of Abu Talib, um, of Abdul Muttalib on his deathbed uh, documented and accepted by both Sunnis and Shias? The statement, so that the statement of uh, Abdul Muttalib, no. So this is only in uh, in Shi'i uh, uh, traditions.
because again it, it would be, if if that was in an authentic uh sunni uh, book of hadith or if it was in their, their major uh historical sources it would it would be difficult then to argue that the prophet's ancestors were kuffar because i think very clearly from the content you see that uh, abdul muttalib was anticipating the uh, the prophet's uh, divine mission so no so th this conversation uh, is found in the detail that i've covered is mentioned is is found in Shia sources and uh, in a very general sense it's it's mentioned in sunni sources and and in sunni sources you'll see that uh, that Abdul Muttalib basically appoints Abu Talib and requests him to look after uh, Muhammad because he's an orphan. But there's no uh, talk about uh, how, you know, if you witness his heyday, I want you to support him and defend him. And uh, so, so those details are found in, in Shia sources. All right, thank you. And... Um... So the Prophet's mother and father both passed away from disease while traveling between cities. Do we know anything about how common such deaths were back then? I mean, you can imagine that they were that deaths like that were very common. Uh, we mentioned that you know during the uh, when the Prophet was with Halima, um, you know, during the first, you know, four to five years of his life, there was a cholera outbreak in Mecca. So there were, you know, uh, epidemics, there were, uh, there was the spread of disease. And of course, you know, medicine was not advanced. It was very primitive. So people would die regularly of diseases that are very easily treatable uh, in our time. So it, it's very common, especially in, when you're traveling, you're you're exposed to different uh, viruses, different germs. So you get sick, you get an infection, and your your condition can worsen pretty rapidly. So we don't know exactly. We know that she became ill, but we don't really know the nature of her illness, what type of uh, sickness it was. We assume that it was some some type of uh, could be a virus, a disease. We don't know exactly what it is. Meningitis. Allah alam. Thank you. And uh, the story of uh, Bahira, the Christian monk, is that the only story that we that there is of the Prophet meeting a monk, or is there more than one such story? So we'll cover that, inshallah, in our in our coming episodes. It seems that this is something that happened at least on a couple of occasions, but uh, as uh, as we continue, inshallah, I'll touch upon that. Inshallah. Thank you very much, Shaykh. Jazakumullah. Thank you so much for uh, for having me and giving me the the honor and the privilege and uh, I hope all of you guys are benefiting alhamdulillah from the the feedback that we're getting I think people are are learning a lot and, and hopefully you know this is a, a khidmat service that we're offering to the community because again if you go uh, online you're you're probably not going to find a uh, a detailed seerah of the prophet uh, based on a Shi'i narrative at least one that's not uh, all, you know 100 lectures uh, and more. So we're hoping, inshallah, that people benefit, and I'm happy that you guys are participating. And may Allah all uh, reward all of you guys who participate and work hard behind the scenes to to arrange these programs. Allah, I mean, these are extremely, extremely valuable programs. So thank you so much. Jazakumullah. Inshallah, I'll see you guys next week. And please keep in your dua. Oh, actually, uh, there's one more question now. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, the question is, if a non-Muslim comes to learn of Islam and they believe in Tawheed and Nabuwa, but they do not verbalize their belief in the form of Shahada, are they considered Muslim? Yeah, I mean, if <clears throat> if they don't, uh, they're not they're not required. I mean, obviously, when you when you practice Islam, when you perform the prayers, you recite the uh, the kalima, but uh, but. 
assuming that conditions don't allow you to verbalize it, let's say someone is living in a, in a region where they're not able to publicize that, they're not required to. As long as a, a person acknowledges the oneness of God and you know the, the tenets of Islam at the level of the heart, it's not a condition that it has to be uh, verbalized. So yeah, a person will still be considered Muslim. Ahsantum Jazakumullah. I'll see you guys uh, next week, bi'idhnillah.